Um, and to keep this interesting, I suggest that we take audience questions as and when they arise. So please do stand up, shout, raise your hand if you have something that you want to add. Um, so to kick things off, um, it would be great to hear a few words from each of our speakers on the panel and hear about them and instructions to their practice and what they do, starting with, uh, with, with Henrietta. Okay. Um, good evening, everyone. Well, this is Henrietta Newton Martin with you. I'm a legal generalist by profession. I'm president of the ISO Hartman Advisory. And also, I'm working uh, on a UN based project that is an academic project. Oh, well, that's about me. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Fawad uh, Moki. I am co founder and the head of legal uh, association uh, at that Villa Pro LLB. Also, I'm specialized in uh, commercial uh, cases and legal cases as well. And then um, I am passionate of development also. Geography, uh, perspectives, backgrounds, which I think lends itself very well to a uh, topic as broad as this litigation management. Uh, legal ethics. Starting with, with Henrietta. Yes. You have ethics. So, um, just to set the perspective, um, we all understand, of course, what are legal standards and what are ethics. Legal standards, of course, they are territorially different from one uh, um, I mean, country to another, and that is normally devised by different countries that is, uh, and promulgated by legislation. That is a legal standard. And ethical standards, of course, they are uh, based on human ethics. Now, it cannot be denied that um, legal standards and uh, uh, ethics are correlated. There is a union between two, and just uh, and we need to understand that as custodians of law, uh, because we are I mean, lawyers, judges, or in the legal professionals. They are custodians of law and societal values, and that cannot be denied. So in our practice, and even in my experience as in-house counsel, and having, uh, and I'm presently associated even with a UN project, uh, so I realized that ethics and law are interconnected, and it cannot be denied that you know even while we handle any particular case, ethics is involved. For example, in litigation management, when we talk about evidence, when, uh, when, uh, for example. Most of the countries in the world say perjury is an offence. And talking about UAE, the, uh, the penal code of UAE says, uh, as per Article 253 and 257, that perjury is an offence. Now, moreover, even lawyers, judges, arbitrators for that matter, even translators are not impregnable uh, to do whatever they want. They are, in fact, um, they are bound by the law, even if you are a lawyer or a judge. For example, Article 257 says, if a judge takes a particular witness, accepts a witness, knowing that the witness has committed perjury, or he himself is involved in something and gives a judgment that based on a false witness, so the judges or even the lawyer knows it, so their practice will be suspended at least for a year or more, depending upon the facts and circumstances of the case. And on the other hand, in case it is proved, then uh, they might even be sentenced to say uh, three years to fifteen years, depending again because there's a cross-reference there to the UAE Penal Code under Article 63. So law and ethics, they are as if married together. They are stuck together. Sometimes we may be uh, it may be oblivious. That you know, or we be pushed into oblivion rather. That ethics is involved in the practice of law. We might push it into oblivion, but it cannot be denied that it is an integral part of law. So I just spoke about evidence. Like I spoke about perjury, the lawyers and judges also being uh, bound by the law, even though they are from the legal field. Now, even forgery, for instance, again, that's an example where ethics is involved, like fake document creation, and uh, um, you know, in doing it, in fact. Raising a fake claim or filing a false case in some parts of the world we call it malicious prosecution, but here in UAE, okay, fake claims, even uh, even how trivial the matter might seem. So they do take um, such offenders into task, and the imprisonment can be 
from six months to even 15 years, if at all, depending again on facts and circumstances of the case, if there is a cross-reference to Article 63 of the UAE Penal Code. So that's about forgery. Now, talking about UN, uh, the United Nations Congress in the year 1990, that is to be precise, on the 7th of September 1990, uh, they, uh, you know, there was kind of uh, an instrument that they signed, adopted rather an instrument, uh, which spoke about the role of lawyers, where law and ethics again are involved there, and they thought upon the aspect that lawyers need to uh, maintain confidentiality, governments need to take initiative in terms of, uh, um, you know, Having or giving rather free access to their people to legal aid, and their, their organizations have to be set up, and so on and so forth. So the UN also is involved, and um, they have set up certain guidelines for lawyers. Apart from that, there is this International uh, Legal Association, uh, Bar Association of London, uh, where they normally talk about two main aspects about um, you know um, confidentiality again. That's a basic concept which they come up on that, and it is written in their text saying that uh, yes, confidentiality has to be maintained by the lawyers in the best interest of their client. And uh, of course, especially if it comes to even uh, public interest litigation, the intricacies of that particular litigation has to be explained to their clients. So, uh, this is about it for now. And uh, I'll go on to the next question when you ask me. Yeah, thank you. Well, it's obviously a very broad uh, topic. Um, the Department of Law Firm, which is a regional law firm, we are operating in five countries, in four countries, and with five offices. Uh, my practice is over the three past panel as to how you embed strong legal ethics, manage client expectations from the very outset in the engagement letter. When you're onboarding a client, what do you do to ensure that you are satisfied um, that you're discharging your duty and that the matter and the relationship will be conducted to the highest ethical standards? Uh, let's go back to Henrietta to, to kick this off. Thank you. Uh, well, I think, firstly, I'd I, I recall a particular treatise by Kitchener and Anderson when he spoke about five-fold cornerstone principle for lawyers. So before I delve into that entirely, I think I'll just uh, brush through this aspect as well, where he talks about autonomy, where a lawyer is an independent thinker. He adopts autonomy, and then he talks about justice. Now, interestingly, when he speaks about justice in his stereotypes, he says that trait equals equally, and unequals unequally. Now, this might seem a little bit oxymoronic because when we talk about human rights, ethics, we talk about equality. But when it comes to law and rendering of justice, it cannot be denied that we need to treat equals equally and unequals unequally. As my friend, uh, Mr. Head, that he just pointed out about an aspect where sometimes a lawyer can, um, you know, can or rather may or may not take a particular case in case it goes against his ethics. Okay, so referring to that, and even coming back to this aspect of Kitchener and Anderson, where he says, treat equals equally and unequals unequally, but when you represent them in the court in the pursuit of justice, a lawyer needs to find the difference why he is defending that particular person and what are the points of difference and why he is being treated unequally when he's prosecuting a case. Why should a person be treated unequally? So this is what Kitchener and Anderson says, that in the pursuit of justice, sometimes you're bound to treat people unequally. This goes against ethics, against the concept of equality, against even if you want to talk about the, uh, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, Article 1, it talks about equality, or any other constitution in the world for that matter. In the world, every country has its own constitution, and of course it, it operates as a grand norm, and that, again, they talk about equality. But as a professional, as a lawyer, even as an in-house counsel, there are certain matters that you will have to handle based upon the principle, treating certain things equally, or certain people equally, and some people unequally. 
So apart from that, he speaks about how a lawyer needs to defend the client, even if you are in house counsel. The first thing that they would do is you work around the code of ethics of a particular organization. The first thing is you work around the code of ethics. Well, let me put it this way. Let me go step by step. The first thing as in the house counsel to address your, uh, your question would be first you refer to the code of ethics or as in house counsel or even because I've got the experience of both being in house counsel and also being part of a law firm. So being part of a law firm, our services was engaged. And being part of an in-house counsel, we are swinging the services of a law firm. So playing both the roles. So I would say that the first thing that a company does, being a corporate lawyer, being, uh, being an in-house counsel, the company does is they would refer to the code of ethics internally. That cannot be denied again because we really do. And then when a matter comes forth, then we take it forth to the top management and ask their advice on that. Then after that, we hire the services of a particular law firm, having studied the cost factor as well. So the first thing is you work around it, you look to the ethics, then you study the cost factor as well, and you see the best, and then you see their services management level, how they serve, because it, it's not always about the fees, but it's also about the services they render, how effectively they render, and then it is also about settlement arrangement or settlement agreement. Because uh, while you're dealing with cases, and while you raise evidence in-house, and while you raise even witnesses, so you marshal through the witness strategy, while you go through that, the other party gets to know, yes, they are getting the case stronger. For example, recovery of views. Example, recovery of views. Your documents get stronger, your witnesses get stronger, and then there is a possibility that they might come in for a settlement. So, uh, in-house counsel will not even forget the aspect of settlement strategy, where you check the inflection points there and the off-ramps and the inflection points, and then you go around it. And you know, in my experience, sometimes you even use risk analysis model like ZOPA, that is the zones of possible agreements, decision trees. And then you arrive at settlement. Now, if at all there is an external counsel involved, we sit across the table and we try to explain to them the exact situation. We coordinate with them. Okay? And then we try to resolve the situation. But as an in-house counsel, for all these things happen, the first thing is we nip the matter in the bud. We see that before the problem or the conflict. The first stage is a conflict stage. Before the conflict, conflict in, uh, uh, you know, it evolves into a dispute, we see that we net the matter in the bud. Why? Because cost factor is involved. Not that we do not want the services of an external counsel. We have plenty of them when we are uh, a company. We have several law firms that are attached to us apart from having an internal legal team. So we try to nip the matter in the bud because no one wants disputes. It's not just cost factor, it's also about no one wants dispute. The rigmarole of it, we don't want to go through the rigmarole to, a, to the tedious process and it has its own vicissitudes. We go through that, you, you hire the services of the lawyer, then you, it's, it's all, and in this time factor as well. Now, talking about practical takeaway. Um, doesn't need to be all of that, but could be one final concluding remark. Henrietta. Okay, so I think the final concluding remark from my side would be to practice non maleficence as well, along with benevolence that is um, in the best interest of your client, in the best interest or the welfare of your client. Apart from that, you have to apply ethics. And ethics and law are intertwined and cannot be forgotten. And, uh, um, uh, you know, you. Do whatever you do, you work in the best interest of your client and as in-house counsel, um, strategize or try to unite legal strategy with business objectives as in-house counsel. So legal strategy with business objective and not forgetting non malfeasance and working um, in the best interest of your client or your company, not forgetting or pushing, um, uh, what do you say, uh, ethics into oblivion in your practice. So this is about it. Uh, I'd like to, I'm sorry, just another thing uh, with respect to litigation management, I think 
uh, taking into consideration that time is a resource. Dubai, uh, I mean, in 2018, they've come up with C3 codes. Interestingly, what are C3 codes for those, uh, like, from my, our friends from other countries? C3 codes are codes where, uh, you know, the court of instance, the appellate court, and the Supreme Court work all together one time. Yeah? So the Supreme Court, the, uh, of course, sorry, the court of first instance, the appellate court, and the Supreme Court work together one time while in the dispensation of justice or while, or while disposing of a case where the entire case is resolved within 30 days. We call it C3 courts. Unlike the um, other other parts of the world where we first go to the court of first instance or the trial court or whatever you may call it in your country, the court of first instance, the appellate court and the Supreme Court. So we have C3 uh, courts here. And as part of litigation management, again, there are softwares where in-house counsels use, like case spacer and so on. Brilliant. Thank, Thank you very much. Final, final thought. Yeah.